Hey guys, Mr. Hyatt here. This is the AP Biology Chapter 5 Lecture uh, Part 2. So we left off talking about uh, the difference between saturated and unsaturated fats. Um, so now let, let's talk about what makes one fat different from, from another. Um, different fats are what makes them different, I'm sorry, uh, is which fatty acid chain uh, is being used. It's going to give us different properties based on, uh, the, the, again, the shape. Uh, fats can be used for energy storage, they can be just used for cushions, and they are also used for insulation uh, to keep us warm. So which, which has more energy, a kilogram of fat or a kilogram of starch? Well, uh, if we think back to biology one, we talked about ATP releasing energy when we break bonds. A fat is going to have more carbon-hydrogen bonds than a starch, Bec so that it will provide more energy. I, I, I stumbled my way through that, and I apologize about that. But there are more carbon-hydrogen bonds in a fat than there are in starch, so there's more energy per molecule in fat than there is in starch. So that may or may not be something good to commit to memory. Phospholipids are going to be huge when we start talking about cells, and you already know that because you know the structure of the cell membrane. Phospholipids are similar to fats, but they only have two fatty acids. And the third alcohol of the glycerol is attached to a phosphate molecule instead of that third fatty acid. Here's a picture. So we get, let's start with the structural diagram first. So here's our, our choline that, that's kind of the, the tip of the, of the head, basically. We get our phosphate group. Remember, this is... Our, this is our glycerol here. So instead of having a third chain, we've got this phosphate that's connected with the choline. Uh, and then there are our fatty acid tails. So we only have two over here instead of three. Uh, here in the space filling molecule, you can see a little bit more three dimensional uh, what it's going to look like. And then, of course, this is how Mr. Hyatt's going to attempt to draw phospholipids throughout the year. Uh, kind of looks like a stick figure. Remember, we've got the hydrophilic heads and the hydrophobic tails. That are going to give it uh, its special structure and function. So the, remember hydrophobic means it doesn't like water, hydrophilic means it does like water. And uh, it also has to do with how lipids interact and how proteins interact and how water interacts. It's basically what's going to allow us to have a barrier between our cells, uh, between the inside and the outside. Steroids are yet another type of lipid uh, that we hear a lot about. Uh, they're four fused rings, so these are really big molecules. Things like our sex hormones are steroids. Uh, things like cholesterol are steroids. Uh, and what makes one steroid different from another is the functional groups that are attached to those rings. Some of them are going to be anabolic. Some of them are going to be catabolic. and uh, So they're going to build things up or tear things down. And what's going to dictate that is uh, those side chains. Moving on to protein. Uh, in terms of protein, um, most of the work that's done in the cell is done by a protein. We talk about how our DNA uh, is, is the recipe for building a human. Well, that's only true because the DNA gives instructions for how to make proteins, and the proteins make us who we are and let us do the things that, uh, that we do. Uh, made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, just like everything else, but now we add in nitrogen and sometimes some sulfur. Again, there's not going to be a general formula because, as you're going to see, they're really complex. So in terms of our uses, like I said, they do just about everything. They provide structure for us. They're enzymes, so they catalyze reactions, make things happen faster. They protect us. They move things around. They transport things. They act as receptors, and they act as hormones. So they, they do a lot. Oh, sorry, I skipped a slide. Uh, so proteins are going to be polypeptides of amino acids. So we're going to build a whole bunch of amino acids together uh, and create, link them with peptide bonds and that's going to be our protein. Amino acids, amino, that should sound like something that you know. Uh, that should tell us that we're going to have some sort of a nitrogen. Uh, we've got an acid, it's an amino acid, holy cow, it's amino acid so we've got an acid and an amine. Hmm. Uh, then we've got some hydrogens and we've got some sort of a side chain. There are 20 different kinds of side chains. Uh, notice we've got nine nonpolar, six polar. Uh, we've got two acidic and three basic uh, side chains. So those are our amino acids. They're going to 
interact differently. If they're polar, if they're nonpolar, uh, they're going to have similar characteristics. So here are nonpolar amino acids. Uh, so remember that these all end in ene, unless they obviously don't. These all do, so phenylalanine try tryptophan does not. So it's not an ene, it's a fan. Proline, isoleucine, leucine, valine, alanine. Notice all of them have a similar structure except for what's in the box. What's in the box makes it different. Here are our polar and our electrically charged amino acids. Again, same structure uh, except for what's in the box. <clears throat> so I, I think I said this already, but the different properties of those side chains, those R groups, are what gonna, are going to determine the properties of the protein. They're going to determine how the protein folds, so that's going to cause it to function one way or, or another. Um, the polypeptide chains, like I said, we're going to uh, form a, a linkage there, <clears throat> excuse me, a peptide bond. It's again going to be dehydration, so we're going to remove water and we're going to make a backbone that's NCC. Here's what we're talking about. So here's our peptide bond. Here's what's going to be another peptide bond ends in an OH, our COOH, so the acid end, and our amine end of the next group, that's our NH3, gets the water gets removed, and so now we end up with NCNCC. So we've got our nitrogen carbon backbone uh, to our amino acid. Proteins, however, uh, are complex. They do a lot, so you can imagine they're not going to have a simplistic uh, function. So we're going to have four levels of organization. Each of these is going to get their own slide, so I'm not going to go through them uh, in detail on this one. Primary structure is going to be the sequence of amino acids. And you can see here, uh, you can kind of see it's a little fuzzy, uh, but you can see it's just a chain. Which amino acids are in which order? That's going to be our primary structure. Our secondary structure, we're going to get some hydrogen bonding between the parts of the peptide backbone. So we're going to get alpha helices and we're going to get beta pleated sheets based on the chemistry uh, in the amino acids. So here we've got hydrogen bonds happening and we're forming a helix. Here we've got our hydrogen bonds forming across molecules and we're getting a pleated sheet. Uh, now when you get to college courses uh, on campus you'll be able to you'll be expected to be able to predict what's going to cause which uh, for our purposes just know that some amino acids lead to alpha helices and some amino acids lead to beta pleated sheets uh, this picture a piece of paper that you fold a whole bunch of times and you all know what a helix looks like you've seen the molecule uh, dna our tertiary structure is going to be bonding between the, the side chains so we're going to get things like hydrophobic interactions causing uh, two molecules to, to buddy up essentially so that they don't have to mess with water. You're going to get ionic bonding because some of these R groups are charged. Some of them are acidic, some of them are basic. You're going to get disulfide bridges. If you happen to get two sulfurs next to each other, they're going to form a covalent bond and share their electrons. And we also could get some hydrogen bonding. Here's what I'm talking about. Get a hydrogen bond here between uh, an OH and uh, a double bonded O. So that's going to be a weak bond. We've got a hydrophobic interaction here where these molecules don't like water, so they buddy up. That causes our, uh, maybe this is an alpha helix, causes our helix to bunch in places. Sulfurs can share. We can get ionic bonds. I know I'm going quickly through this. Quaternary structure, we're going to combine tertiary structures. So we might have, uh, so we might have this is hemoglobin as an example. Here's collagen. So collagen is several helices wound together. Picture a rope. You've got strands and you wind those together and it forms a rope. That's, that's what collagen really looks like. Hemoglobin is really complex. There are some beta pleated sheets. There are some uh, helices. There, there's, there's a lot going on uh, with hemoglobin. This is a good example of a quaternary structure. It's complex. It, it's, it's a lot. So is it important? Is the protein structure important? Well, heck yeah, it is. We, I keep saying form controls function. Uh, you, you've probably all heard of sickle cell because it's such a great trait to study in, in genetics. Uh, but notice it, it's, it's a deletion. So this valine 
is a, uh, the, I'm sorry, it's a deletion that causes a frame shift. So our protein's primary structure is different, so it causes the hemoglobin to form sickle cells as opposed to normal normal shaped cell. Here's kind of a better picture of that. Check out the secondary and tertiary structures. Already we're different. Quaternary structure already we're way different. We're getting these subunits that are completely misshapen. You roll those together and it ends up adding up to a round blood cell and a sickle shape. Not good. Denaturing of a protein is something that is almost always on the AP exam. Uh, it's going to be anything that causes the protein to unfold. Uh, acid can cause that. A pH shift can cause it. Uh, high salt concentrations can do it. And heat for sure can do it. It's one of the big reasons that uh, it's bad to get a really high fever. Your proteins start to unfold and they unfold and they don't work as well. Building off of uh, proteins are these chaperone proteins. We're going to talk quite a bit about these later. Um, but just wanted to introduce them today. That's why I call them a C-level uh, item. They're, they're these comp uh, complexes that basically help other proteins fold into their correct shape. Um, that we first identified it, identified them in heat stress. We found uh, evidence of these chaperone proteins in uh, people that, that were heat shocked or uh, things along those lines. But they basically, they're kind of like spell checkers. Here, here's kind of a picture. So chaperonin is an example of these. Uh, you can see that an unfolded protein goes in, the cap closes, and the protein gets refolded, the cap comes off, and, and it's fixed. Um, so quickly, let me wrap up uh, amino acids. I'm sorry. <clears throat> uh, yeah, quickly, let me wrap up proteins. Um, many other... Uh, amino acids are possible if you change the R group, but uh, we don't have them. We could genetically engineer these uh, to be better, but um, sometimes we, we do manipulate the genomes and we do express these, these uh, non-natural uh, amino acids, but it's definitely an, an area of research. That's the end of lecture two. We'll finish up with lecture three.